Now look at the notes for extract one. You will hear part of a consultation between a psychologist and a patient called Mr. Barry. Hi there, Mr. Barry. Your GP has referred you to me to discuss your anxiety. So tell me, how have you been feeling? Well, I'm still suffering from the anxiety and panic attacks, and the medication that I'm taking, I found that it seems to have some side effects, and it makes me still feel a little on edge. So I found it better to take the medication at night rather than in the morning, and so I can get on with the day kind of thing, but I still feel quite anxious. Okay. Getting used to the medications can be difficult. Going back, when did you start the treatment again? Oh, uh, what, three weeks ago now? And that was the citalopram, the one to hopefully control the panic symptoms longer term, and the chlordiazepoxide, which is for the more short-term control. How many of the chlordiazepoxide are you using a day at the moment? Well, the doctor gave me 20 milligrams three times a day, but to be honest, I'm trying to cut them out. I only use them if I really, really need them. Good. And do you feel okay with that? Yeah, it's like I don't feel like they suppress me enough, if you get what I mean. I know that my main aim to tackle this is, to be honest, is getting fit and more exercise, because I know that's the feeling that I need to aim towards. Because I know from past experience that when I work out, I feel better, I feel more relaxed, etc. So I'm trying to work towards that. So, how many actually are you having at the moment? Uh, today, I've had to go into work just for a conference with my manager, you know, just to discuss how things are going and stuff. So, I had to take two because I just felt like I couldn't manage it otherwise. Right, okay. So, over the past four or five days? Uh, none, except for the two today. So, you've actually been laying off them altogether? Yeah, I've been trying, and when I do take them, I don't... I only feel suppressed for a very short amount of time. Right. Now, the citalopram medication... Yes, I'm on 20 milligrams once a day, and the side effects headaches were quite bad to begin with, and I'm still getting them, but I think that could be more stress-related, because they're not very... I wouldn't call them painful headaches. I just can feel they're there. I also had a sore ear, so I wondered if I might just have an infection or something too. Okay, we'll come back to that. Um, but you're now taking the citalopram at night. Yeah, I found that if I take it first thing when I get up, I still feel quite edgy, and also the side effects. Yes, okay, right. Now, the reason you started the treatment was because you were getting full-blown panic attacks. Can you tell me a bit more about the attacks? Yeah, well, I couldn't leave the house. My heart races, and I really struggle to breathe, and I just feel an intense fear. It makes me feel sick and dizzy if I go out into the street. You find it very difficult to get out and about. Are you beginning to normalize, do you think? Yes, I've managed. I've got, I went over to the soup store on my own and I managed. I felt a bit, a bit jittery at first, but you know, I've learned over the years after suffering quite severely with them years ago that you just have to take your mind to a different place. And, you know, I just concentrated on what I wanted from the shop. That was the first time I've been out on my own since I started on the medication.
referred to me because of some pain in your face. Now, I've got some notes from your GP, but perhaps you can tell me in your own words about the pain, uh, when it started, and uh, what's happened since? Well, it began about three years back. Uh, out of the blue, I got this terrible shooting pain in a back tooth. Mm-hmm. I've never felt anything like it before in my life. Oh. Um, see, it was a tooth I'd had a nasty abscess on a few years before, and I assumed that it had got infected again. Anyway, I went off to the dentist as soon as I could get an appointment. So he did some x-rays, but he couldn't find anything wrong, which was very strange. Was the pain continuous, and did anything in particular trigger it? Uh, It came and went, and it lasted just a minute or so each time, but it really got bad when I brushed my teeth. I always use an electric toothbrush. Um, They're so much better than the usual sort, but I didn't like that one little bit. Um, I even tried to persuade the dentist to whip the tooth out there and then because I was so sure that that was the problem. But he told me he was pretty sure there was nothing wrong with my teeth at all and I ought to see my GP. And your GP has diagnosed trigeminal neuralgia. Well, first of all, the GP told me to try painkillers. That was to exclude things like a migraine, I think. But the pills, they didn't have any effect at all. So then he sent me off for a CT scan because he said it might be a very bad case of sinusitis. I'd had that before when I was a teenager. Um, Or he said even nerve damage, but that was all negative too. So then after all that, the GP eventually put me on an anti-epilepsy drug, which seemed to help. I see. Uh, So how is it now? Well, the pain sometimes goes away for weeks at a time, but then it can come back a dozen times a day. Fortunately, I get a tingling feeling in my jaw when it's going to start, which I can recognize as a sign. So at least I get a bit of warning before the pain comes on properly. Um, And I can try to find somewhere quiet to sit down. But the pain has now begun to spread. Yes. It started to happen in my eye, too, on the same side as the tooth. Mm -hmm. I was doing okay until the firm where I work moved to a new office. It's a lovely new building, um, and everything was fine at first until about three months ago when the weather started to improve and they turned up the air conditioning because lots of people were complaining about being too hot. That's when I started getting pains in the eye, and I'm pretty sure it's connected. But the system's the same all over the building, and it's not as if I'm sitting in a draft, so there's not much I can do about it. I've tried wearing glasses all the time, and that seemed to help a bit, at least at the beginning. And these pains in the eye, tell me how long they last and how often you get them. Uh, It's getting worse and worse. Over the last fortnight, it's been every day, and sometimes every hour, and it's really excruciating. It's getting me down, and I've started losing weight too, what with the worry and pain, and I've had to give up my yoga class, which I loved, because you never know when the pain's going to come on, and well, that's making me feel very isolated. Um, I really hope you can do something more for me, Doctor. That is the end of part A. Now look at part B. Part B. In this part of the test, you'll hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B or C which fits best according to what you hear. You'll have time to read each question before you listen. Complete your answers as you listen.
Now look at question 25. You hear a dietitian talking to a patient. Now read the question. So what seems to be the problem? I feel such a failure. I'm sure people think that if I just tried harder, I could lose weight. Maybe I need more willpower. Well, firstly, well done for seeking medical help. Actually, being overweight or obese is a medical problem, because being overweight changes how your body works. Oh, thanks, but I do feel that it's my fault for being this way. Well, I hear what you say, but... Please understand that these days we consider that obesity is a disease, like high blood pressure or asthma. You see, the body's signals to the brain stop working correctly when you're overweight, and with time you feel less full, even if you eat the same amount. And when you cut calories, your body tries to use less energy to keep your weight the same. Question 26. You hear members of a hospital committee discussing problems in the X-ray department. Now read the question. So next on the agenda is the problems in the x-ray department. Nick, would you like to fill us in here? Well, as you all know, this is a very busy department. Uh, so we have four x-ray machines in all, including one in the fracture and orthopedic clinic area. But recently, one of the other x-ray machines developed a fault. And so we had to apply for authorization for the purchase of a new tube for it. There's been some kind of hold-up with the paperwork, and while we've been waiting, patients are being brought into the fracture and orthopedic area for x-rays there instead, and of course that's causing further congestion. Question 27. You hear a senior nurse giving feedback to a trainee after a training exercise. Now read the question. OK, that went quite well, didn't it? But it took you a while to work out where the CPR board was kept. Yeah. So what does that tell you about this scenario? We need to check where things are before doing anything else. Exactly. And, of course, it takes a second or two to put the head of the bed down because you've got to have that part of the bed flat before you slip the board in. I wish there was a quicker way. So do I put the CPR board under or would I normally hand it over to somebody else? It makes no difference as long as it's done. Question 28. You hear a trainee nurse asking his senior colleague about the use of anti-embolism socks for a patient. Now read the question. I noticed that Mrs Jones isn't wearing the usual anti-embolism socks, but I didn't want to ask her why not, because she was asleep. Is it because her legs are swollen? Well, sometimes we don't recommend the socks if there's severe swelling with edema, but that's not the case here. Mrs Jones was actually given them initially on admission last night, but she told us this morning that her lower legs were feeling numb. She described it as having no feeling. Until we've checked out the reason for that, for example, it could be an underlying condition which could damage her arterial circulation. We're reducing the risk of thrombosis by pharmacological means. Oh, I see. Question 29. 
You hear a vet talking about her involvement in the management of the practice where she works. Now read the question. At first, when I took over the financial running of the practice, I felt rather thrown in at the deep end. I really needed to know my stuff and be super organised, especially with the number of new drugs and treatments available now, all of which have to be very carefully costed. It keeps me super busy, but monitoring stocks and so on helps give me confidence and allows me to see how everything fits into the overall picture of working as a vet. My manager's more than happy to leave me to run this side of things. He's in overall charge, of course, but I can always go to him if there's a problem. I keep him closely informed of what's happening. He's always pleased if I manage to make savings anywhere. Question 30. You hear a physiotherapist giving a presentation about a study she's been involved in. Now read the question. I'm a physiotherapist, and I'm presenting our poster about constraint-induced movement therapy for children suffering from partial paralysis following brain surgery. We did a case series of four children who'd all undergone hemispherectomies. They were admitted to inpatient therapy within two weeks post-op and began therapy two to three weeks post-op. The therapy continued after they were discharged. Our findings were that three of the kids regained excellent function and mobility with ambulation and upper extremity function. One didn't do so well, unfortunately, but he gave up the therapy early on. This type of movement therapy has been used a lot in adult populations following stroke. The findings here promote moving forward with further research on the pediatric or adolescent population following either hemispherectomy or other surgeries, to help us decide how appropriate this therapy would be for them. That is the end of part B. Now look at part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B or C which fits best according to what you hear. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at extract one. Extract one, questions 31 to 36. You hear an interview with Dr Bob Dean, who's talking about a trial he conducted to assess different ways of treating the condition known as tennis elbow. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36.
The condition commonly called tennis elbow is a painful condition of the tendons which interferes with tasks involving gripping and manipulating objects. A recent trial led by Dr. Bob Dean has tried to see what type of therapy works best. Bob, is there a typical way that tennis elbow starts? It's a very common condition. But apart from tennis players themselves and people working in industries where they do certain manual tasks, it's surprisingly difficult for patients to pin down the actual start of the pain. And even with those high-risk activities, it's generally something that comes on over a period of time. In tennis, it used to be said it was down to the player's grip or the type of racket they were using, but nobody's really researched that thoroughly. There are plenty of guidelines out there, but they're not evidence-based. When somebody has pain, then modifying their tools, whether that's a tennis racket or something at work, may well help. But that doesn't necessarily mean there's a causal link. So what was your approach in the trial you conducted? Well, we divided our patients into three groups. One group followed a physiotherapy program. Another was asked to do nothing to see if the condition just went away by itself. The wait-and-see group, we called them and people in the third group were given steroid injections. The physiotherapy we used was a specific elbow manipulation. The therapist applies manual force to the elbow joint, and at the same time, the patient actually performs the kind of task that causes the pain. The aim is to apply the force in a way that relieves that particular pain. But just as important is the physical activity the therapy calls for, because in most tennis elbow patients, their muscle system's quite debilitated. And I understand that complete rest wasn't seen as an option? Instead, you described something called smart rest? Resting's an interesting thing. Immobilising the arm in a sling is probably the worst thing anyone with tennis elbow can do. In fact, resting most muscular skeletal pain isn't good. What we advocate is something called smart rest, And what this means is being as lively, as dynamic as possible, but not hurting the elbow. An example is where patients avoid picking things up with their palm facing down, which is classic advice given to anyone with a condition. But patients do need the stimulus of movement to help rehabilitation. And so all our participants were given advice on how to manage their condition ergonomically, even the wait-and-see group. The difference was they didn't get any other form of treatment, whereas our other two groups did. So what were the results? What we found was that steroid injections were more effective in the first six weeks, but not after that. The physiotherapy group also reported good results at six weeks, comparable to those for the injection group, and much better than those reported by the wait-and-see group. But then, after three months, the situation had changed, The physiotherapy group was now reporting better results than the injection group, and, remarkably, so was the wait-and-see group. Indeed, they were catching up all round, so much so that after six months, physiotherapy is no more effective than doing nothing. At 12 months, and what's fascinating is that with a second study to show this, the recovery rate for people who do nothing was 70 to 80%. So what does all this mean for patients? What advice would you give them on the strength of this trial? I'd say, in the first instance, rest the elbow and see how it is in three months. If it hasn't resolved itself by then, they're probably one of those 20 to 30% who aren't going to get better. At that stage, I'd recommend they have some sensible physiotherapy. I don't think there's much evidence to support the use of steroid injections until a really good attempt's been made with the wait-and-see approach backed up by physiotherapy. But it's still worth trying at that stage because the alternative could be some quite drastic measures, even possibly surgery. I see. Now, it's quite common for people to think that if something's sore and swollen, they've got to take anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen. Are they right? Well, there have been various studies about this, and what they've found is that there's little evidence of inflammation in tennis elbow, so there's no reason to think that non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are going to be very beneficial. So I suspect that just taking basic over-the-counter pain relief would be at least as successful as taking anti-inflammatory drugs in the case of tennis elbow.
Now, look at extract 2. Questions 37 to 42. You hear the monologue of a physician giving a lecture on ankle fractures. You have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42. Hello, Doctor. What are the types of ankle fractures? There are different types of ankle fractures, and treatments vary significantly based on the location and severity of the injury. When a broken ankle occurs, the injury may be to the end of the medial malleolus, called tibia, or to the lateral malleolus, called or both. There are many types of ankle fractures, and let me explain you about certain common types ankle fractures. Lateral malleolus fractures is the ankle fracture that involves only fibula. Most of the lateral malleolus fractures can be treated without surgery if the ankle joint remains stable. A surgery is recommended in case of an unstable joint or the ligaments are damaged. However, the hint for surgical recommendation is when the fibula fracture is within 4 cm of the end of the bone. In such case, the fracture can be treated non-surgically if there is no injury on the inner part of the ankle. Medial malleolus fractures involves only tibia. This fracture occurs to the bone on the end of the tibia, which is called the medial malleolus. An isolated medial malleolus fracture is very rare compared with an isolated lateral malleolus fracture. Generally, a displaced medial malleolus fracture is treated with surgery. Bimalleolar ankle fractures involves both fibula and tibia that occur when there is an injury to both the inner and the outer side of the ankle always resulting in an unstable ankle joint, and surgery is to be recommended for most of the patients with this kind of fracture. Even if the fracture heals without a perfect positioning, the ankle joint alignment will remain disturbed and could result in accelerated arthritis of the ankle. Even after a surgery, ankle cartilage can be damaged at the time of the fracture, resulting in arthritis. Therefore, a proper diagnosis and repair of these fractures is essential to avoid the chance of long-term problems. Although a bimalleolar equivalent fracture involves only fibula, there is also a tear of the ligaments on the inner side of the ankle, resulting in instability of the ankle joint. Therefore, a surgery is essential. Trimalleolar fracture involves both fibula and tibia, like a bimalleolar ankle fracture. However, the bone in the back of the tibia, called the posterior malleolus, is also fractured. At times, if a large fragment of bone is fractured, a surgery is inevitable. Posterior malleolus fracture involves only tibia. This is a rare injury in isolation. Fractures of the posterior malleolus generally occur in association with bimalleolar ankle fractures. In such case, the injury is called a trimalleolar ankle fracture. Maison nerve fracture involves both fibula and tibia, which is a less common injury. However, this injury needs to be diagnosed thoroughly, as there are chances of missing this injury. In this type of fracture, the bone is injured on the inner side of the ankle, called the medial malleolus. The force of this injury passes through the large ligament that connects the two bones of the leg, called the syndesmosis. Since the damage is caused to this supporting ligament, the ankle becomes unstable, and most often a surgery is recommended.
This is the end of Part C. You now have two minutes to check your answers.